welcome to season two of The Afterword. In today's two-part episode, we will be welcoming Gavin Peacock. Uh, Gavin is a former professional soccer player in the English Premier League and current pastor and author. Uh, during his 18-year professional playing career, Gavin uh, played in over 600 top-flight games, uh, including an FA Cup final with Chelsea, um, where he hit the, the crossbar, and uh, he scored 135 goals along the way. Um, and he played alongside some of the all-time greats uh, in the game and for some of the world's biggest clubs. Um, a, a bit of a disclaimer right off the top, uh, Johnny and I are huge soccer fans, and um, although he would uh, probably make fun of me for calling it soccer, uh, as would Gavin, um, Johnny and I just couldn't resist uh, spending uh, quite a bit of time discussing our favorite sport with one of the, the real legends of the game. So what we're going to do is release this conversation in, in two parts. Uh, part one is going to be uh, focused on Gavin's playing career, and we'll, we'll get into the weeds a bit on, on things like VAR and Gavin's favorite goal and who he thinks is the best player in the world and of all time are and, and some, of those, some of those fun questions. In part two, we're going to focus on Gavin's um, ministry and family life. Uh, so we'll be discussing lessons he's learned on, on parenting and uh, pastoring um, and things like that. Uh, now, I realize many of you listening um, might not be interested in sports or soccer specifically, uh, but I'd really encourage you to, to stick this episode out, even if you're, you're tempted to skip it. Uh, I think you'll find Gavin to be a, a great storyteller and filled with, with really practical insights that are relevant for any Christian. Uh, on topics like parenting and evangelism and balancing a stressful work life with family life. Um, and really, above all else, Gavin is just crystal clear on the gospel. I think it's something that shines throughout his, his life and his story. Um, his, his autobiography, which just released from Christian Focus, is called A Greater Glory, From Pitch to Pulpit. Um, and just a few days ago, I actually I gave a copy of this to a, a good friend of mine. Um, I have been playing pickup soccer with this friend for about eight years, and he's, he's not a believer, but he just so happens to be a, a huge Chelsea fan, uh, which is one of the teams that Gavin uh, really starred for during his, his playing career. Uh, so I think uh, there's a great chance that this friend of mine is going to, to actually read this book because it's, uh, as I mentioned, he's a great storyteller. It's a real page turner and is filled with a lot of really fun and exciting stories. Uh, but also as he reads, I know that he's going to be presented with the gospel, which as I mentioned, is a real uh, shining theme throughout all of Gavin's uh, life uh, and throughout the book. So I'd really, I'd encourage you, if you have a, a non-Christian friend who, who loves sports, um, pick up a copy of A Greater Glory. I think it's a, it's a really, really good evangelistic tool that um, many will, will read and, and be presented with the gospel. Uh, Christian Focus has done a nice job with the production. It's a, it's a hardcover with a dust jacket. And it even uh, includes some, some fun full-color photos in the middle from Gavin's playing career. And you'll, you'll see some, some highlights there with, with Gavin's fantastic mullet and, and short shorts. Um, so for a limited time, we have um, a greater glory for 50% off uh, on our website, wtsbooks.com. Uh, so please, um, yeah, check it out and maybe think of somebody who you can give a copy to. So with that, uh, by way of introduction, let me kick things off uh, with a question for, for Gavin and Johnny. And uh, here I'm looking for a little bit of reassurance, I hope, as a U.S. men's national team fan. Uh, we haven't had a lot to celebrate um, in recent years in terms of World Cup qualifying, but um, do you think uh, the U.S. men's national team will win a World Cup in our lifetime? 
Uh, what do you think about the young wave of American talent who are playing really well across Europe from Dortmund's Gio Reyna to Chelsea's Christian Pulisic? Um, are these legitimate talents or are they all just overhyped? What do you think, Johnny? Uh, no. Northern Ireland have a better chance than the United States. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I don't think so. Um, I remember Pele said that before 2000, an African nation would win the World Cup. And I think Nigeria probably came the closest, or Ghana at one point. But uh, even still in Africa, where football is even bigger than in America, they still haven't been able to to do it. I think because you've got basketball, baseball, and American football that remain the dominant sports, it'll be hard to ever get to the level uh, where the country could actually produce a team that win it. Obviously, you do it with the women's football team, soccer team. They've been fantastic over the last couple of decades. But uh, that's my thoughts. What about you, Gavin? Do you think the United States can win the World Cup in, the, in our lifetime? Well, I'm a bit older than you guys, so definitely not in my lifetime. Uh, but uh, no, I mean, I, I've I watched the US team really develop into a into a decent international team, and I even went to the World Cup a few years ago now in in Germany with the BBC, and I was commentating on on the USA and Czech Republic uh, game, and they were a difficult team to play against. Um, but I agree with you; I, I, it's always going to be hard to. Uh, get that level that you need to be at to win the Men's World Cup uh, when you are uh, at, a, at a domestic level uh, competing against these other big uh, American sports. But, you know, some American players have, have, have come through the ranks and played in the Premiership and proved themselves to, to, to be excellent players. And, uh, you know, I, I still in, enjoy watching a bit of the MLS and, uh, and those guys. And, of course, Beckham has got dipped his uh, toe in the water there down there in Miami. So uh, you, you never know, but I, I don't think so. What about Canada? What's uh, football like in Canada as a national sport? Yeah, as a national sport, you know, it's, it's pretty weak. But uh, I will say that in two years ago, they had an inaugural league of eight teams. It's, a, it's a Canada's own professional league now for the first time. And uh, Calgary in Alberta, where I live, we have Cavalry FC, coached by an Englishman who was actually an apprentice at Swindon Town when I was at Chelsea Football Club back in the 90s. And uh, the idea is that if this league takes off uh, and the, the World Cup is being hosted by the Canada, US and Mexico, uh, you know, that maybe they will be able to host some games here in Canada and there will be a generation of, of, of interest. Um, Again, you know, it's competing against big American sports. Of course, ice hockey here is huge. Uh, and with the weather being so cold for so long, you're limited as well to outdoor football um, and, and ice hockey takes over. Uh, but it's got room to grow for sure. And there's interest at grassroots level, big interest. Yeah. Well, as we can tell from your accent, Gavin, you're not from Canada. You've been living there now, uh, what, 15 years coming up? A bit less than that, yeah, 13 years. Yeah. 13 years. Uh, but tell us a wee bit about your background. You're from England, but tell us a bit about your family background, where you're from. Yeah, uh, so I was um, I was born in um, just on the cusp of southeast London there, just into Kent, the county of Kent, um, 1967, a few years ago now. Uh, and I was born actually into a, a, a footballing family. Whenever I say football here, you just translate soccer. So into a footballing family. Uh, my father, Keith, was a professional footballer for Charlton Athletic, uh, South East London team. And uh, he played for 17 years there. He was a one club man, which is quite the unusual thing nowadays with the, uh, the migration of players around to different clubs and, and countries. And so I grew up in a footballing family, uh, mum and dad, a solid marriage and, uh, you know, looked after, cared and loved uh, care for and love my my sister and myself um so i had a good home life uh not a christian home life um but a solid family and i was brought up around the smell of the dressing room i i, I would go down on a weekend and watch my dad play and and then he would take me there in in the school holidays to the training ground and and i would you know be up and down the terraces and in and out the the changing rooms and watching the players play and 
uh, and they all knew me by name and it was kind of like you know some of them would babysit for for me you know they were like friends and so I had this kind of insight into the professional world with my father being this great player and an example and, and a coach to me as well and um and having the players that were like friends as well as inspiration so it really stoked the fire in my heart to uh, follow after uh, my dad so yeah so, solid home life um and good school life went to a grammar school uh, old-fashioned grammar school in in southeast england there and with a with a an aim to becoming a professional footballer which is the schoolboy's dream uh, for a lot of schoolboys in uh, and now school girls in the uk yeah and uh reading your book uh, a greater glory from uh, pitch to pulpit which i've thoroughly enjoyed I didn't know this, but you had a short spell in the States or two occasions in the States as a teenager, as a young boy. Yeah, it's, it, it, I mean, I was going through the ranks of getting my schoolwork done. And then in England, if you're a good uh, footballer, you get representative honours. So I was selected to play for my district and then my county. And just when everything was going well, um, my father's career, uh, Charlton had come to an end and he was looking to uh, get into coaching. Um, and we, he got an offer to coach in uh, Columbus, Ohio for a summer season. And so we went out there and just tasted a little bit of Midwest America. And, uh, you know, it was so different because the soccer there was all about cheerleaders and razzmatazz and shootouts. And they didn't do shootouts in England. You know, a draw was a draw. You got one point. Americans want to win. <laughs> um, so we got a taste for it there. And then we thought we were going to come back. And my father got offered the assistant coach's job at the Tampa Bay Rowdies um, in Tampa Bay there. And that was in the NASL. That's the North American Soccer League. And in those days, it was really big. So the Rowdies, and they're still an MLS team now. They're, they're going today, the Rowdies. But then they were getting 40,000 at home games. They shared the stadium, the same stadium with the Tampa Bay Bucks there, the same stadium as you see now. And uh, some of the best players in the world, including Pelé and Franz Beckenbauer and George Best and Johan Cruyff, were all gracing this league uh, from coast to coast. And it was exciting. It was well marketed. And as I say, with the crowds and, and the TV, that they, they, it was a very popular sport. So we had two years in Tampa. And, and so I was exposed then to kind of, I, I'd have said, like Tampa's kind of like the, the Manchester United uh, of that league, except you didn't have the cold rain. Um, it, was, it was big. And the, some really good players from all over the world were playing. So I was watching these continental players up close and personal. And, uh, I got a little job on a match day uh, working in the opposing team's dressing room, helping the kit man. And I was only 12 at the time, but this was fantastic because all these great players from all the other teams were coming and I was giving them their towels and, and cleaning their boots for them and listening to the team talks and sitting on the bench. And, you know, it was just a, it was a wonder world for a kid like me that just loved football and wanted to become a professional. Yeah, and uh, you returned after that back to England and soon were spotted by um, some Premier League teams, um, including the great Liverpool Football Club. But uh, unfortunately, they didn't offer you a contract. But uh, it was QPR you went to first. Do you want to just talk us through, because many of our listeners wouldn't be familiar with some of these teams. Sure. Just talk us through your football career from QPR to Gillingham to, Newcastle, uh, to Bournemouth to Newcastle, Chelsea, back to QPR. And even yeah. Char uh, Charlton Athletic, is that right? And yeah, back to my dad's team. So yeah, so we returned to, to the UK and I actually, uh, in terms of representative honours at schoolboy level, I made the England schoolboys team. So that's you in the best, you're in the best 18 boys in the country then. And I had, my father wisely kept me from signing schoolboy forms with any team. So that when I was an England schoolboy, all the other boys were signed up and every team in the country wanted to sign me, including Liverpool, your team, who were, they were actually my second favourite team then. In the 1980s, there wasn't a better team to watch than, than Liverpool. Yeah. And my uh, Latin teacher at school, uh, Mr Glover, was a, he was a scouser and he would want to talk to me all the time about Liverpool and he knew they were interested. He was trying to get me to sign for them. But I was a London lad and QPR was a top division team. We'd say Premier League team. Then they had a 
bright young manager, Terry Venables, who went on to become England's national manager, and a, sl a smaller club than Liverpool, but a chance of coming through the ranks and making the first team a bit quicker. So I decided to sign for QPR. Then I was in the world. It's, now it's, it's a man's world. It's not a game anymore. It's business. It's hard and it's tough and it's full-time training and it takes a while to develop the steel in your muscles and, and, and the steel in your, in your character uh, to, to actually make it through. So even though I'd signed the contract, I hadn't really made it till I'd made it. Um, I got my first team debut at age 19. Uh, I was still living at home at the time. And uh, my father was then the manager of Gillingham Football Club. And they were a couple of divisions lower than Queen's Park Rangers. And I was, at this point, in and out the first team as a young player, a little bit impatient to play every week. I, I have to say that. And wanting to play in the centre of midfield with an attacking role for midfield, which is... I felt was my best position and QPR weren't playing me in that position. And one day I, I came down for breakfast and my dad was sitting there and he looked pretty thoughtful. And I thought he's just thinking about the team at Gillingham and what he's got on in practice today. And, and he said, uh, I've got a problem. I said, he said, I need a, I need a midfielder. He said, uh, and it occurs to me that there's one sitting opposite me that could make, do me a good job. Would you, would you fancy coming on a month's loan? And I was, just eat my breakfast. And I said, yeah, I'll come. He said, I'll play you in your best position. And you might, you know, it'll be a good platform for you to, to develop your game. And maybe if you stay with, with Gilliam to go up again from there. And so the decision was made to, for me to sign for my own father over a, a bowl of Weetabix and uh, my dad did sign me. So suddenly, you know, he's not only my dad, he, he, he you know, he, he, he was now my manager. Um, and, I had a 18 months at, at, at Gillingham, played 80 games. And, um, and by this time, I've really developed my game. And then Harry Redknapp uh, was the manager of Bournemouth. Um, and he bought me uh, 250,000, which was, it sounds, 250,000 pounds. It sounds like it's just loose change now when you talk about professional football or, you know, even if you think of big American sports. But then it was a club record uh, for both teams. Uh, both Gillingham and, and, and Bournemouth. Um, I had a year with Harry Redknapp and then Newcastle United came in for me and they bought me. And Newcastle United, they were in the second tier at the time, but a sleeping giant, a massive club in the north of England with a great history, wore black and white stripes. And my family hailed, on my dad's side, hailed from the northeast themselves. So there was a, a great draw to, to go there. And I had a two and a half wonderful years at, uh, at Newcastle and ended up getting promotion to the Premier League as captain of the team um, uh, under a manager called Kevin Keegan. Um, and then uh, after my son was born, we decided we were to move back down to London and Chelsea Football Club bought me. Glenn Hodder was the manager and I had four, almost four years there, played in FA Cup finals and semi-finals in Europe before returning to Queen's Park Rangers, the club I started with, and having a good few years to finish with. And a nice little sort of swan song in the final uh, year of my career was that I, I went to Charlton uh, on loan uh, for three months back in the Premier League and made a few appearances there. All through my career, people say, are you going to play, pull on the red shirt of Charlton, follow, really follow in your dad's footsteps? And, and it was never quite the right timing. And then just in that last year, it opened up and... And by then, my dad was assistant coach at, the, at Charlton. So I even went back and was coached by him once more. And, and that's I finished an 18-year, 600 games, 137 goals mm. career, which is long and, and uh, fulfilling career uh, in professional football. Yeah, and you played under some, for those of us who know the game of football, soccer, you played under some great managers. Terry Venables, England manager. Glenn Hoddle, England manager. Bobby Robson at under England under 19. You went to South America with him. Yeah. Ozzy Ardiles. You got to be coached by him. And then Kevin Keegan, who also became the England manager. Yeah. So uh, you've been privileged to play under some great, great managers, great men. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, obviously I tell all these stories in my book. And that one thread even in the book is a study of, of great leaders, you know, because mm -hmm. I have played for some of the top coaches in the world 
uh, they not only were top players, they, they became top coaches as well. And so an insight then into what made each one, uh, what was the, the greatest strength of, e of each one? You know, I can think of Kevin Keegan was the great motivator of men. You know, he, he could know what to say to one player that would make them tick and a different word to another player. And Glenn Hodder was a great visionary that could, he transformed Chelsea from uh, a physical team into a soccer playing, fluid, continental looking team and, and so on and so forth. And so you, you see these threads are great leaders. So, yeah, I learned a lot from, from my managers and each one made a significant contribution to, to me as a player, but, but none more so than my own dad. Yeah, that's one of the nice uh, parts of your book that you clearly have a great affection for your dad and great respect for him. And uh, I think at one point you say he was the greatest manager you ever played for. <laughs> mm. and that's just a lovely tribute to him. Um, so, yeah. Now, I, I, uh, I have a son who's mad for football, eight years old, and uh, I've been reading your book to him in the evenings, half a chapter at night. He's absolutely fascinated by it. Love the opening chapter on Wembley, FA Cup final against Manchester United. And, uh, he asked, could I ask you a number of questions? So these, these questions are from Ben, but hopefully still interesting for uh, our listeners. Yeah. yeah. So uh, he wanted to know who you think is the greatest uh, footballer ever. I was going to give you three options. Uh, George Best, George Best, <clears throat> and George Best. <laughs> oh, there's a little bit of bias there, but I mean, hey, I, 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 I tell you, I'm going to go for Pele because for the longevity, the pressure he played under at the time, and you you know you only have to watch the the recent documentary on Netflix about Pele and see all the political pressure he was under, and just just the goals per games, three World Cup win, you know winning medals, that that kind of thing. But I, I believe it was Pele that said that George Best was the best player in the world. So that just shows you how good George Best was. He didn't have the longevity that Pele had, nor I would say quite the ca the character. Though I have great I have great admiration for for Best because if anyone. And he had a great time in in, a, in an America playing for LA uh, uh, for a few years. Is that um, he was a very brave player as mm -hmm. well as you know you often get that the skillful players, uh, but then you people forget even like the Lionel Leon Messi's they're very brave because they take a lot of physical hits. So the likes of George Best was was up there. But I'm going for Pele. Uh, even ahead of the likes of uh, Messi and and Ronaldo and of course uh, the great Maradona who who yeah. died recently as well. Yeah, I, for me it's Maradona, but I think I wonder if it's to do with who you were watching in the World Cup when you were a young boy. Yeah. You were, you were ten years ahead of me, so maybe it was Pele for you. I watched Maradona in the '86 World Cup, 1990 World Cup, and I just thought this guy's got one foot, doesn't need his right foot. And he, he reminded me of Best because he would dribble past players and ride tackles. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you know, scores that an incredible goal against England from his own half. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, for me, you know, joking aside about Best, I, I think Maradona was. But you're right, Pele had the character, the longevity, the goals. I just felt when I watch Pele, I don't really see the dribbles and, the you know, beating five, six players. Maybe he did. Maybe I haven't seen yeah. that. Or he did. Maradona. Yeah, they have that about them, you know. Yeah, they, yeah, there is a lot of clips of, of Pele going past people, but I know what you mean. They have that little bit more of a slalom move about them, like a skier that goes, you know, side to side um, in the way that they dribbled. But uh, talking of Maradona, you mentioned one of my managers, my coaches being Ozzy Ardiles. Mm. Uh, and for those who don't know, Ozzy Ardiles played for Tottenham Hotspur in the UK, but he, he was an Argentinian international and won the World Cup with Argentina in 1978. And he, because in that squad, I think Maradona was like 15 or 16 and he was in the squad and he was Maradona's mentor. So I yeah. was coached by Maradona's mentor. Um, and he said to me, he said, Maradona had feet like hands. In other words, what you could do, the dexterity you have with your hands, he could do with his feet. He could put the ball wherever he wanted and do whatever he wanted. He was a magician. Um, next question. Um, what, what do you think is the greatest goal ever scored? 
Um, well, it was a goal I scored at St James's Park. <laughs> it was never really caught on the big screen. Uh, <laughs> I could send you a video of it, but it was a please do. Yeah. It was a clearance out the box. It was pumped back in over my head. I caught it on my right foot onto my left thigh and volleyed it into the top corner all in one movement. And I've not seen a better goal than that, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> I should tell you about the one. I thanks to the grace. It was at Crawford's Burn Park on a Friday night in Northern Ireland. <laughs> There you go. We can talk about all our yesteryears. I, I, one of the best goals, I mean, there's some great goals, was um, David Beckham's goal from the halfway line. Mm -hmm. was it Was it um, Wimbledon? Wimbledon, because yeah. it was played at Crystal Palace's ground then. They were sharing, yeah. they were sharing the ground. Yeah, and it, it put... Beckham was in the England squad within a few months. It, you know, we knew... I mean, I played against Beckham and he was young. And I'm you know, um, out there thinking, this kid's... Not only good looking, he's got amazing ability as well. He's, you know, could he get any better for him? And then I pl uh, played against him the year before, and then he opened the season with that goal uh, from the halfway line. And just, you just don't see people do that. Mm. You just don't yeah. see people do it. So it was one of the best. Yeah. Um, who was the best player you ever played with? Glenn Hoddle. I've played with some great players, world-class players. Ruud Hullet, the great Dutchman who won World Footballer of the Year, uh, played for AC Milan, won the European Championships with Holland as captain. I played with uh, Gianfranco Zola, uh, was basically, you know, he followed on from Maradona at, uh, at Napoli um, and became this great Italian player. Um, but Hoddle's brain was like I signed for Chelsea and Kevin Keegan, my manager at Newcastle, called me and said, you will learn more from playing with Glenn Hoddle in training than anything else. And it was as if it was as if Glenn had this computer in his mind that he picked the ball up and he saw every single option that was available. And he always picked the most dangerous option to, to pass and he could pass it inside outside the foot, left or right. And I'd just see Glenn get on the ball in midfield and I'd make a run and it, I'd just hear the ball just coming round my ear and landing perfect in, in front. I, I to, to make an illustration, it was as if he's this great quarterback, you know, and he could see everything and he just made the right decision every time. And he didn't really have any speed. Uh, he wasn't a great tackler uh, or great header of the ball. But when he had, he owned the football and it did whatever he wanted to do. And if Glenn Hoddle had played for Brazil or France or Spain, he had, I think he had 50 odd caps for England. He, he would have had 100, 150 caps and they would have built the team around him because he played in a very continental style and a pure football. Um, Eric Cantona, who was a great player, obviously for Manchester United, we beat Manchester United when I was playing for Chelsea, and Cantona said in the newspaper the next day, Glenn Hoddle was like Mozart in a world full of heavy rockers. And I thought, what a great description of Hoddle. He was like pure classical music. And I thought, that was wonderful, till I realised I was one of the heavy rockers that Cantona was talking about, and uh, uh, you know, it lost its shine for me, but yeah. 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 Uh, who's the best player you ever played against? In my in my era in the Premier League, of course, Beckham was coming through. Giggs was still fair. Ryan Giggs was still young. Um, uh, Paul Scholes, they were coming through. But as an established player, Eric Cantona, no, few people graced the Premier League like Cantona in, in the 90s. There was a spell there. It was He was called King Eric, a Frenchman. Uh, first Frenchman to play in an FA Cup final, the, the FA Cup for, final I start my book with when I played uh, for Chelsea against Manchester United. And, um, yeah, he he was a striker, big, strong, had this air of confidence about him, uh, and he, he could do just the unusual thing with the football. Like um, the great players... The great players are, are those that usually as a professional, you you read you can read the game and you know what players are going to do. But the great ones do things that surprise you as a professional. And Eric was one of those, one of those players. Yeah. Um, 
Did you ever get a red card? No. Okay. My, red my, card. my son is fascinated with red cards. He wants to know who got one, why did he get it, did he deserve it, how many games is he out for? <laughs> one nowadays, because you can't tackle nowadays. Yeah. You know, just flicks someone by accident and it's a yellow card. And yeah. uh, lots of the players, the hard men in my era, mm-hmm. they wouldn't have lasted two seconds. I think it's gone too too far the other way. You know, you players need protection, but there is an art to the game in terms of tackling. And there's a physical side uh, to the game. But uh, I got a few yellow cards, mainly for mistimed tackles. Not really for being a, uh, nasty, but for mistiming my tackles. And um, I wasn't a renowned tackler of the, of the ball. I, yeah. was, I was being avoiding tackles because I was a more attacking player. Yeah. Um, speaking of tackles and uh, people getting away with things or not getting away with them, VAR, do you think mm-hmm. it's a good thing for the game or a bad thing? Overall, a bad thing. I, I was never convinced of it when they brought it in. Was it, I don't know, around the last World Cup time? I... I okay, I can see the goal line stuff, maybe. Um, I mean, England might not have won the world. You and I will know England might not. You and I will know England might not have won the World Cup in 1966 if VAR had been in play. But in general, you know, it's pulling back the game uh, to to three, four, five, six moves before the ball's gone in the net sometimes. And it's also, I mean, you're dealing with a a toenail of, of difference between offside and, and onside and the stoppages, which is just not part of football and, and, and the way that we have, you know, it's more part of, um, you know, NFL or something like that, you know, used to that, these plays, but it's, it, it's, um, it stagnates the game too much. And so overall, and for the different players and ex players I've spoken to, who are watching it, the game more than I am now, even because they're over there and in it, uh, I'd say no, not good. I like the element of human judgment uh, that comes with the referees and the and the linesmen, and with that, a little bit of human error at times, and you have to roll with that, you know, and accept the injustice of it at times as a player. Yeah, that's helpful. I think I would agree with you. I um. I think it's taken out the tension and drama and the excitement of scoring a goal that you know it's a goal as soon as he whistle and now you have to wait to see. Um, yeah, uh, you um, you were captain for Newcastle, Chelsea, and I think QPR. Yeah. Uh, what do you think makes a good captain? What what makes a good captain? That's a that's a good question. To to be a good captain you must be able to inspire your teammates. You must be able to inspire them. You, you must be able to, to, to lead them, either by example or by your words or by both, um, which means that you don't need to be the best player, actually, in the team. Uh, some of some of great captains, they weren't the best players, but they, they were one of the best, so they were good. You know, you can't be you know, really struggling every week with your performance and be captain. Um, but they had this ability to do things in the game that would stir the one, the players around them, whether that is make a, a, a timely tackle that changes the momentum of the game or or make a run with the ball and a score a goal um, uh, to, sh- to show a never-say-die attitude. Um, and so I think those, you know, being inspirational uh, and being able to lead your team, and I think showing as well, that you will sacrifice for your teammates. Um, and I remember Kevin Keegan saying to me when I was a young captain at, at Newcastle United, Gavin, he said, as captain, you've got to give even more of yourself to the team than the other players. And I was like, wow, you know, I was only pretty young then. And it's enough just to get my own game right. If I start concentrating on everyone else's game, you know, I, I wouldn't do as well. And then that's no good to the team. But to develop that ability to kind of keep my own game on track, but still be able to have a, an eye for the bigger picture. And I guess that's like in life, you know, as you grow more mature in life, you have a broader view of things, a, a, an eye on the bigger picture a bit more and a, and a more of an awareness or maturity ought to bring more of an awareness uh, of others and ability to help them. And so good captains then have, a, I suppose, a maturity beyond their years and able to apply that to a team situation on the field and, and off the field. 
Hmm. Um, who was the best manager you ever played under? Apart from my dad, um, I would say difficult one between Kevin Keegan and 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 Glenn Hoddle. I mean, uh, I mean Keegan was just such a great motivator and a leader of men. He made me feel like I could, you know, run through a brick wall and score a hat trick every week. Um, but 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 Glenn taught me how to play at the highest level. Uh, I mean, I captained Chelsea into the European Cup semi final, uh, and so for both had their moments in my development. May, maybe Hoddle just, but yeah. it was close. Uh, what was the best? stadium for an for atmosphere that you played at? Uh, Wembley Stadium, England's National Stadium, was the best. And, you know, I described that in the book uh, at the beginning. And it is is so historic, although they've rebuilt it now, but on the same plot of land. It's so historic, but when you walk out of the tunnel, so the tunnel is like this long plastic thing that protrudes out and you walk out they see you coming out down the far end of the stadium first and so they start to cheer and it's like a it, it catches fire around the whole stadium it's like a bowl and comes around the back of your neck and you can imagine 90,000 or 100,000 people in the stadium doing that so Wembley was in terms of a domestic um, stadium to play at it would be Manchester United or Liverpool Anfield just a one, you know, you, you play at either of those stadiums. And, and I would say even particularly Liverpool, there's something moving about the Liverpool fans when they sing, uh, you know, you'll never walk alone and the, the, red, the red flags are out. It, it's moving for, for an opposition player, let alone, you know, for, for, for a home player there. Yeah, I'd, I'd go more, I'd go a bit further and say, I think it's eschatological, not just moving. <laughs> A religious experience, a Christian experience, yeah. Um, what um, What's the best game of football you've ever watched? The best game of football uh, I have ever watched, I would say, it was when uh, Newcastle played Liverpool and Newcastle were going for the title, you might remember this, in the 90s. 1996. Yes. What was the final score there? 4-3. Yeah. 4-3 three, three to Liverpool. And it was just backwards, <laughs> forwards. And both teams playing wonderful football. You yes. know, yeah. thing. open, end-to-end, um, uh, two of England's great football clubs. Uh, obviously, Liverpool, more of a winning history than, than Newcastle. And with what was at stake for, for yeah. Newcastle... That was just in in my era. That was one of the yeah. best things I've seen. You know, I I was in hospital getting a hernia operation. I played a lot of field hockey, and I picked up a hernia. And I um, was in getting an operation. And that night, I'd come out of theatre, and I'm sitting, and I have the radio on in the ward, and I'm listening to this game, and I am up on my feet, jumping mm-hmm. around hospital ward <laughs> because was it yeah. Rob Tyler? Bjornaby or someone sticks the ball in from the left and Robbie Fowler comes in mm. and bangs it into the net with his head. And then the next year, it was the exact same scoreline. Do you remember? It, but this time it was like 3-0 to Newcastle or Liverpool and then it got brought back to 3 all in Liverpool. I think it was Stan Collymore. Collymore, yes. yeah. Yeah, I remember that goal. Yeah, those are those were great games, yeah. yeah. Um, now, this is a bit of more of a tricky question. Um if you were playing today, uh, would you take a knee before the whistle? Uh, no, no, I'd have to stand on my on, on conscience there in terms of no, um, you know, I I believe Black Lives Matter, but I don't believe in hashtag Black Lives Matter uh, and all the political uh, ideology behind that. And so, I mean, I was involved in. Um, Show races and the red card, which is a movement in the UK to kick racism out of sport. I was involved in that, and in, in its inception, I was well, I'm a, one of the patrons of it. I've spoken around at different football clubs, uh, educating you know uh, youngsters in schools on racism, it's the evil of it, uh, talking to people, so on and so forth. But this has gone beyond that, and I think even some of the uh, players and managers have 
have come out. I mean, Les Ferdinand, uh, you know, director of football at Queen's Park Rangers, friend of mine, great player for Newcastle, QPR, Tottenham and England. He said, you know, it, it's uh, what for whatever it was, it's gone beyond that now and we need to move move past it. And it's uh, the other thing is it's... Um, it's a, it's compelled, like you know, you're, you're forcing people to do something against conscience at times. So, I would have to stand on my conscience on that. Yeah, and I've noticed Wilfred Saha for right. Crystal. Yes, yeah. he doesn't kneel. He he stands because he thinks it's just lost its significance. Yeah, but I think you're right. As a Christian, you you have to see the underpinnings of it philosophically in society and yeah. movement. Black Lives Matter is really not good news. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's that's interesting. Okay, final few final few questions before we bring this first half of this interview to a close. Uh, what do you miss about being a professional footballer, and what do you not miss about being a professional footballer? Um, I, I miss two things about being a, a professional footballer. Uh, one, I always tell people being super fit, and I, I speak at a lot of church gatherings and and the men's meetings, and I look around and I say that most of you have no idea what that means, do you? Being super <laughs> and they're all looking at me and laughing. Uh, I said, well, actually, most of us in this room are, are, are feeling so, uh, I said, being super fit is like this. You you give it, you can run and run and run, and, uh, uh, and you play these games, and you go to bed, and every muscle is killing you, aching. You can barely, and then you wake up the next morning, and it's like you've got a new body. You, you're, you're that fit. You can, do it again and now for most of us it'd be three four weeks before we felt like we had a new body in fact most of us are praying for our resurrection bodies and looking forward to that day we've got so many uh, aches and pains um but being super fit is a great feeling um doing a job that you know you love to do uh, obviously it has its pressures but you love to do and, and having that feeling as super fit and the other thing is being with the guys in the dressing room because there's something about men gathered together, playing for a, a greater cause where, where the risk is high and the reward is great. is something that stirs being a man, you know, uh, something about manhood in there and, and, and team and doing it together. The, it's, hard, it's been hard, hard to replicate um, in, in other areas. So, yeah, I miss those two things. What, what don't I miss? I don't miss the uh, injuries and the, and the pain uh i was for the last two or three years of my career i think i lived off pain on painkillers because of back injuries and knee an ongoing knee injury um so it, it and you know it it has its big pressures you know you, and you you're just an ordinary man uh with ordinary things going on in your home life and you're subject to extraordinary pressures in your job life that is under such scrutiny uh, when you go out um, and so although I love the pressure there's also a bit of a relief from that pressure when it when it does when the career does end. In your book which we'll come on to in the second half of this episode uh, you you take time out to actually speak about what it's like to be a footballer's wife what it was like for Amanda your wife. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to just give listeners a wee insight into what it's like because I, I don't think I'd fully appreciated this. Yeah. And, uh, really interesting aspect that we don't ever really know about that's right well i mean it's it's a difficult job i mean for being a professional footballer is a it's a transitory experience so the wife might be very happy in a certain area like my wife was in bournemouth on the south coast of england and we were a year married had a nice little job and we're lovely near the beach and then i come home from training and say we're going to newcastle north of england it rains every day it's freezing cold but it's a big club and a great opportunity. And my wife, after a few tears, is like, okay, here we go. You've got to be a, a skillful and wise homemaker because as you settle the home, it will help your husband to, to settle. And obviously, if you've got kids as well. So it's that transitory uh, experience. Um, I think also for a footballer's wife, um, she, her husband is open to not only public praise, but public criticism. And she'll sit there on a match day and, and hear what they're saying about her husband or read what they're saying in the, in the papers. And sometimes it is, it's really harsh and, and can be quite personal and, and hurtful. And to be able to kind of 
ride that. Um, and I, uh, with your husband then being a public man, there's also a little bit of that sharing your husband with the public. So we would go out to dinner and people will want to, you're middle of your dinner with your wife on a Saturday night, they want to come up and ask for autographs or talk to you about the game. And, it's, you know, it's as if you, you, they just know you and, and, that, and that's it. And my wife was very gracious, you know, just understanding that. Because these are the same people that paid my wages that would stand for an hour and a half in the rain when you played away at, I don't know, somewhere like uh, Stoke City on a midweek, miserable midweek night, and they'll wait for you to say, you know, hard luck or you did well or, you know, whatever it was. So it's understanding that little bit of sharing your husband with the public. And, and then finally also, you know, that because it's a public job, the, the men, many men want to be like uh, your husband many women might want to be with your husband and so you know there's that kind of aspect of well can I compete with this kind of popularity can I compete with the adrenaline rush that the that, that professional footballer is you know and he comes home to, to to me so you know these are the pressures that a footballer's wife has to to deal with and nowadays I mean not for my wife not, not for us, but nowadays at the very top level as well, footballers' wives have developed their own uh, personalities, uh, online personalities, whatever. I don't think it's necessarily the greatest thing. They're sort of stars in their own right. Um, it, it came in in the, I'd say, early 2000s when Beckham's wife, Victoria Beckham, star. Now she's at England Games and all the other wives around her and their pictures were in the papers. And then suddenly with the emergence of social media and Instagram, footballers' wives have their own uh, profiles. And I don't think that's a, a very healthy thing. Uh, but certainly in my wife's day, um, as a footballer's wife, those were the kind of pressures that, that she dealt with very ably. Mm. Well, last question or two as we bring this episode to a close. One of the things I liked about your book was you you, you pause at times and you, you make commentary on society, culture, family, and you state the biblical picture, the wholesomeness, the health, the healthiness of what it means to be a family, to raise a son as a father. Um, for young boys aspiring to be professionals in their sport, we're obviously talking about football, soccer, but what's your advice to a young boy who, you know, that's what he lives for at this point in life, and that's fine, he's eight years old or 15 years old, uh, my cousin Archie is uh, in the Aberdeen setup. David's son. Yeah, he's, a good player, he, isn't he? he's mm -hmm. on the track and he's doing well, playing right back, left back. Uh, what's your advice to a young Archie or a, a young boy at eight years old about aspiring to be a professional sportsman? Yeah. Um, hey, you know, there's there's nothing wrong with wanting to be a professional sportsman. Um, you know, you've got to work hard at your school and. Um, listen to your parents, um, obey your parents and, 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 and your coaches. Um, to be a professional, it, it takes great, great sacrifice, and only very, very few will make it. Only very few. Even those that sign that, fir that first, you know, contract as an apprentice, uh, only a fraction of those even get get through. Um, so it's it's a very slim possibility, but it doesn't mean to say that you know you can't give it a go. Um, it's going to take a lot of discipline, a lot of hard work, an ability to be resilient and come back from from knockbacks. You know, when you've played badly or you're told you know you're not good good enough by this particular coach. Um, and then I think a realization to know, okay, is this going to be something that's going to happen, or I have to turn my eyes now towards something else. And that's why you know, having a working hard at school is, is important. But but above it all is to um to love and know the lord jesus christ um as your savior um because as i say in the book football is great it's the greatest sport in in, in my opinion um but but football is uh not it won't last it, you know jesus christ will last jesus christ is eternal so football is great but jesus is greater so to know to know the greater glory in life is uh is is the primary thing even if then you enjoy 
the secondary glory of of having a, a football career, or as or as many like you know like yourself or buddies that you know have, have played the game and enjoyed it at an amateur level and and, and can still enjoy playing uh, for a while afterwards. But at some stage, we are, as I say to all young uh, people, you're an ex sportsman at some stage of your life. It doesn't last. But, but Jesus but Jesus does, and so that's what I would be saying. Yeah, that's a fantastic way to finish this uh, first half of this episode, Gavin. Thank you. Um, we've talked mainly about the pitch. Uh, your book speaks a lot about your early years in football and um, your journey from uh, QPR all the way through to Chelsea and then back to QPR. But uh, the other aspect of the book is that you speak about how you became a Christian at 18 years old. And you basically uh, went through your whole footballing career as a Christian. And so that's what I look forward to picking up in this next episode with you. So uh, to our listeners, don't switch off now. Come back and uh, listen to the second episode. It's like the second half of a game. You cannot switch off the TV at half time, as I say to my wife. You've got to watch the whole game. I nearly switched off the game of Liverpool versus AC Milan in the Champions League final. At halftime, I was living in Australia at Theological College, and I thought, should I, should I just go to bed? It's 4:30 in the morning. I got up so early to watch, and I thought, I'll, I'll give it, I'll give it 10, 15 minutes. Gerard sticks the header in, and Schmitzer scores the second, and I turned to the person beside me and I said, we are going to win this game. <laughs> anyway, I stayed for the whole of it, as you can tell. So, uh, so please join us for the second episode. It's always worth it. And that's where we're going to get into Gavin's Christian life and uh, his ministry. So we'll see you then.